Hello and welcome back to the Single Malt Review. Last episode I promised something a little uh, weird this time, and so I think I found just the ticket in this bottle here. Um, the casual observers will note that this is indeed an Ardbeg bottle, but um, I bet you won't guess which one. It's Supernova, the first edition. And this, this I think is probably the oldest bottle of whiskey in the whole cupboard. Um, arguably I probably should have finished it before now, but the thing is such a, such a novelty. Um, and, uh, well, albeit open and mostly empty, still somewhat collectible just to my to myself because there's a lot of memories mixed up in this bottle. This really was one of the first, um, one of the first mm, really specialist sort of whiskies only a real whiskey person would buy. These are the ones which, which I was ever sold on. So um, it, does, it does have a lot of uh, sort of attachment for me, but I thought I'd drag it out for this because despite everything else, it's actually pretty good. Dram, I think. And it's an interesting time in the history of whiskey as well, because Supernova, this came out at the height of the, or maybe even the beginning of the height, of the great, um, the great Isla heated pissing match between many of the distilleries, but um, Ardbeg and Brooklady were certainly the main offenders. Um, I think Ardbeg has given their uh, Supernova a rest in recent years, but Brooklady is still uh, resolutely producing the um, Octomore. But this this was right in the midst of that heady time of uh, hilariously peated whiskey and um, competing for how much, uh, how much PPM phenolics and so forth you could get in your dram. And that's the sort of that's the sort of whiskey um, nonsense that I can that I can't get behind. I do remember um, buying this bottle, a few sort of dismissive looks from you know more proper whiskey people. Um, it's certainly at the time it was coming out, it was not considered a uh, a particularly particularly good trend. You know these silly silly PPM competitions, but I think I think they're quite fun. I think there's always room for fun um, in whiskey and a great many other things. But this whiskey, despite being fun, it's also, as I said, really, really good, um, as I will try to explain. It's been literally years since I've tasted it, so we'll be going in kind of blind here. And it may have gone a little uh, flat in the bottle, but vital statistics, it is 58.9% by volume, so that's um, fairly strong, fairly strong. And it will be fairly young as well. Um, this will be a clearly cask strength, uh, clearly uncoloured, clearly unchill filtered. Um, batch of casks. I don't know which casks they are, but I think there is at least there is at least a modicum modicum of sherry in here, and I think it's that sherry note that really brings our big whiskey to life. Uh, and it's more interesting expressions. That's why I like Ugadal so much. And this is um, sort of Ugadal on peat steroids, I think. So the whiskey itself, whew, it's still um, it's still there. Can confirm, still peating. Mm. But not as one note as you might think, despite ostensibly trying to be. Ah, there is mostly peat. I mean, you know, it's still it's still what it is. It is a peaty animal, but there is a lot of tar. There is no small amount of sweetness. There is huge, huge maritime character because I think that's um, very much sort of onboarded with the with the peat smoke. There is that salty maritime quality. So it has that in spades as well. It's quite earthy, very earthy actually. Quite a lot of dry driftwood kind of aroma, charred burning driftwood if you will. And it isn't devoid of oakiness either. It's not a sweet nose by any means, it's not particularly uh, fruity at all, it's not particularly, uh, particularly vanilla or spice, it's very very primal and very very um, sort of earthy, woody, that sort of, that sort of business. 
and on the palate, well, at full strength anyway. The peat isn't as, it's not as outrageous as you think. It sort of comes in stages. There's that initial, what people call the, the peaty blast at the start of the palate. But that's accompanied, as it often is, with quite a lot of sweetness that comes with it, which offsets that. Where this is really, really all the way peaty is in the finish. It has a surprisingly, for such a young, well, we're assuming such a young whiskey, I don't think this is, if this is more than 10 years old on average, I'll be highly surprised, highly surprised. But where the peat lies here is on the finish. The finish is quite long and it is relentlessly, relentlessly peaty. It just keeps on going. Oof, I think that's just remembered what year it's in and started to wake up. That's really, really rather strong. That's um, going to want some... That's going to want some water, which I've forgotten. Uh, embarrassing cut, and I'll be right back. Right, there we go. Magic of cinema, and the water is here. Just a wee bit there. Bringing it down to something more like, um, you know, only 50%. And that has calmed it down significantly. There's now a whole lot more going on here, despite Pete, there is a huge, huge whack of mineral spirit. So, acetone, sweet sort of model glue smells, even a little bit of mineral turpentine in there, which I can't recommend um, drinking at all, but it's, I guess it's okay if it smells like it. But that's in there to quite a significant degree. Even a little bit of kerosene, jet fuel, if you will. That is not, that is not unpresent in there. There's lots of weird petrochemical elements there, which I'm quite um, attuned to because um, I quite often handle those for my job, um, my real job. Mm, but it's much, much calmer, much, much sweeter on the nose. It's lost quite a lot of that earth and quite a lot of that tang, which is a bit of a shame because... Um, it's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation with this one. On the one hand, you could have all that and drink it at full, damn near 60% strength. Um, but that's kind of difficult to keep up, really. But the moment you hit water, um, a lot of that, a lot of what really makes that no special is taken away. So, anyway, let's see what's done to the palate. You'd have to call that an improvement. There's a lot more to see now. There is fruits. There's a citrus quality, almost um, almost stepping on Colella's territory, but a lovely lemon citrus juice and peel in this one. Really, really quite zingy. The peat obviously has gone nowhere, but it's just been calmed briefly and possibly we're tasting things that were there all along. Mm, still very, very sweet, and it's still a very, very spirit sweetness. It's, to call this whiskey spirit driven would be an understatement, but it's worth mentioning because it really, really is. The cask character on this is marginal, marginal at best. This is really something, something that has not too far not too far from the nozzle of the still, this one. Both in age and certainly in character. Mm. It's really hard to say whether I actually like it. Um, I think, on the one hand, it has lost some, some of the character that it has had all but all but six years ago or so when I bought this, a very, very long time ago. It may even be seven, now that it is, in fact, 2017, time marches on. Um, I remember it being a little more, a little more outrageous in terms of what it smelled like. There was almost like a natural gas quality to it. 
um, or maybe a more of a gas plant quality, natural gas in its normal form doesn't have much of a smell. But if you've ever been around a gas works, um, that, mm, that does, that really smells quite distinctly. Um, most people would say bad, but um, it's uh, bad is good in Isla whiskey for the most part. Smelly fish and tie ropes and all that sort of thing. So this one, I won't give this one a score because I think it would be slightly silly. Um, one, because to call this unavailable would be an understatement. There are probably a few um, few bottles floating around, um, deep, deep locked inside people's collections. Probably the Isla fans have stored a few of this one away because it was not outrageously expensive when it came out. But I can guarantee you that if you want a bottle now, um, outrageously expensive will be will be on the page somewhere um, with a dollar sign next to it. So uh, good luck there. Personally, I wouldn't really hunt one down. Um, I'd find someone, uh, someone like myself, who might have one bottle gathering dust somewhere in the back. Because I'll bet, I'll bet for such a quirky whiskey, there are a lot of half finished, or in my case, mostly finished bottles, um, at the back of people's cupboards. Because it's not one you just sit and drink. It's one you drink and go, huh, and probably put away, like I did for a very long time. Uh, it's just that sort of whiskey. Moorish? No, certainly not. So no, no scores for this one. Um, I mean, ballpark, I mean, it's probably, it's pretty probably in the high 70s. It's not, an, it's not a fantastic whiskey. There are better Ardbegs there. Ugadal is still my favourite um, Ardbeg whiskey outside of their um, special releases, uh, the Dark Cove, you can look at my review on that one, that was um, very, very good, that one was one of the best things they've done in a great many years, but yeah, this one, not, not a stellar Ardbeg whiskey, but an interesting Ardbeg whiskey, and more interesting to me um, just by the sort of the life and times of whiskey that it represented sort of seven years ago. Um, and that particular, those particular few years when the how many ppm's can we cram in the bottle was a thing. I, uh, I remember that fondly. A lot of other sort of whiskey geeks do not. They thought it was a bit crass. But, never mind. Um, as, a, uh, as a master of the crass, I'm on board. But anyway, that was something just a wee bit different. Oh, actually, if you want to stick around, some bonus content, you will never ever guess. I want you to start guessing right now while I disentangle myself from the extremely narrow space that we sit in to do these movies. And I'll get you something completely different. It's the second release. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Good golly. Um, I was obviously having a bit of a... Um, a bit of a year when I got uh, these two things. Uh, we'll have a real quick look at the other one just to see how they've changed. Um, from memory, it was not a from not a great deal, but probably worth having a look. Mm. Goodness, it'll be time for dinner after this lot. I'll tell you what. So uh, this is the SN, and I don't actually know what the SN stands for. 2010. That's the one they made after this one, back as they say by popular demand. So, and yeah, this one is somehow even lower than the first. Who knows how that happened? Maybe I liked it better. But it looks identical. Anatomically, it is very, very similar. It's a bit stronger, actually. This is a full 60.1% by volume, so we're getting into almost uh, book and no territory here. Crazy. Crazy stuff. And this one, this one extols itself as even sort of deeper and earthier than the first one. And by that I think they're probably trying to intimate that they've put a little bit more sherry character in it. Or at least that's how the nose speaks to me. What it is, is slightly tangier than the first one. Slightly more rounded. Slightly more, uh, maybe a bit indicative of a few older casks gone in here to maybe give it a bit more depth, but in so far as that, I think there is a few younger casks here as well because as much as there is a little more um, depth on the top, there's a little more 
a little more rawness on the bottom. I think this, the spectrums have moved apart for this one just a wee bit. And on the palette, it is a sharper whiskey. Whereas the first one was very, very spirity and lively, this one is a damn sight more fiery. There's more of a raw, hard edged, almost sawtooth edge to this one. You really feel it going all the way down the back of your throat at full strength, anyway. Um, and the peat is sharper as well, it's a tangier peat. There's less sort of a smouldering character, and there's far more of a sharp edge to it. That citrus is very much still there, and possibly even just a wee bit more dominant. As far as it being even more earthy, I'm not sure I'm completely on board with that. It's certainly more tarry. It is a more bituminous whiskey than the first one. But in terms of actual earth, I'm not so sure. I think the first one with its more rounded character, I think that one may have, uh, may have had it there. But we'll put water in. Just quickly, see if there's any marked changes. And it does very much the same thing. Smoke dies down, and a fruity, lighter fruity character, juicy character almost, that was entirely absent, comes in. But Again, it suffers from the same problem. The moment that happens, you kind of lose what it was to start with. So it's a bit of a bind there. As for which one I prefer, I like the first one better. Um, I like the first one quite a bit better because of that. It was more focused, more rounded. This one is just it's slightly all over the place. The palette is broader. There's more going on. But um, in doing that, it's just a little hard to, too hard to button down, I think. Um, it's almost confusing on the tongue. Mm. But anyway, anyway, that's that. Uh, just a wee novelty for you there. Um, thank you for sticking around, especially if you, uh, especially if you check this one out as well. This is the uh, the first time these bottles have gotten any traction in a great many years. So the uh, the bottles, thank you. They needed drinking. Now, I, I suspect, need to eat. So, uh, this has been the Single Malt Review. Thank you very much for tuning in as usual. Um, don't forget, as they say, ever the refrain on YouTube, to subscribe if you want. Uh, no biggie if you don't. I don't really subscribe to all that nonsense. Oops, that was a pun. Never mind, better go before this gets worse. Slanger.